To everyone here in Helsinki, to everyone who's joining online, a warm welcome to the 2022 Millennium Innovation Forum. My name is Jason Palmer, a journalist with The Economist, a longtime science and technology correspondent, and your host for the whole of the forum. And the very first thing that I want to say is how great it is to be back in Helsinki, but to be in a room with all of you. The 2020 prize, you may recall, was delayed until 2021, and the forum. And last time we did this, it was in a television studio not far away. Don't get me wrong for those who were there. It was fun, it was fascinating, but it's just not the same as being in the room with you all. So great to be here. Um, talk a little bit about how we're going to get through the next couple of days, what's on the agenda, and a little bit about the forum itself. Um, you'll have seen here and before, it's innovations for a better life. But there's a long line between ideas and those better lives and the innovation that comes in between. Now, the Millennium Innovation Forum uh, is about looking at technological uh, innovations, how they can be brought to bear on, uh, on the great global challenges that we have to bring together business leaders, academic leaders, leaders from the public sector to figure out how to bring those solutions to bear on the big challenges that we have. The hope is that the forum kind of looks at that middle bit, the, how the ideas get to be the better lives, right? That's my expectation anyway, and I hope yours as well. Uh, to that end, we'll have four sessions. We'll be starting with one today on diversity in research, development, and innovation. Then this evening, there will be a small pause for the small matter of crowning the 2022 Millennium Technology Prize winner and the award ceremony. And then tomorrow, we'll have three more sessions on the green transition, digital transformation, and resilience. Get to know those phrases, you'll keep hearing them again. Now, you might think that those topics, those four topics, represent four more challenges, four big new things to, to worry about. When we used to talk about innovation, it was about things like fostering a good startup culture, or government funding, and how to hand that off to the private sector, or building an education pipeline to make the workforce of tomorrow, and so on. All of those challenges are still there. So you might think that worrying about the green transition or the resilience that the currently crazy world demands of us all is just one more set of things to worry about. But I hope and I expect that what we're going to hear today and tomorrow is a little more hopeful than that. Uh, it's a little bit trite to say that every challenge is an opportunity, but forgive me this, uh, there is a chance that dealing with these new issues, these topics, viewing them through these frameworks, that by thinking about these new things, we help to challenge and deal with the old. All those same things that have always worried people who worry about innovation and how we get to better lives. So I'm excited to be here. Uh, to hear what the agenda packed with experts is going to teach us. I don't know if you've looked through the program, but we've got some fascinating, some insightful people to, to speak to you. Um, and don't worry, there is lots of time in the program for us all to mingle, to network, as is the word, to have the caffeine that I know I desperately need, um, and to share ideas and perspectives as they arise, and do this in person as it was meant to be. But first things first, it is an absolute honor to introduce our first speaker, who's going to set the scene a bit for the forum. Please welcome to the stage, Prime Minister of Finland, Sanna Marin. Thank you so much, dear participants. It is my great pleasure to welcome you all to the Millennium Innovation Forum 2022 and, it, and to this seminar organized by the Research and Innovation Council of Finland. Research, development and innovation are of fundamental importance for our societies. They are sources of welfare, ecologically and socially sustainable growth, productivity, and renewal of our economies. Research and innovation bring solutions to the global challenges we are facing. The positive impact of research and innovation are diverse 
and wide-ranging. The Millennium Innovation Forum and the Millennium Technology Prize celebrate these messages by bringing forward innovations for a better life. The theme of this seminar is diversity in research, development and innovation. This is an important and topical theme. Equality, equal opportunities and justice are fundamental values in our societies. People need to be equal regardless of their gender, nationality or ethnic, racial, sexual or other differences. In Finland, equality of opportunity has been a central principle in the development of the Nordic welfare state, and it is something that we want to hold on to. Dear friends of research and innovation, in the world of research and innovation, equality and diversity plays a particular role. Many studies tell us the same story. Teams that are inclusive and include participants with different backgrounds are often more innovative and productive. It is important that people with diverse backgrounds have the possibility to take part in research and innovation. We cannot afford to exclude the perspectives, ideas and capabilities of anyone. In terms of gender equality, Finland is one of the most equal countries in the world. However, the share of women in research and development personnel is only 35%. In companies, only 20% of research and development personnel are women. These figures show that we still have work to do in this respect. We also need more international researchers and R&D professionals in Finland. The success of Finland is based on education, skills and knowledge. Research and innovation are key elements in this. During our government's term, Finnish research and innovation policy has taken a major leap forward. We have reached a parliamentary agreement on raising the share of research and development investments to 4% of GDP by 2030. Globally, only a few countries currently exceed that level. A new funding law will be implemented, this historical agreement. We will increase state research and development investments in line with the 4% target by 2030. It is crucial that private research and development investments will increase at the same time. We cannot do this alone uh, by public, public sector investments. These decisions provide predictability and a long-term basis for the development of the research and innovation system in Finland. Companies, research institutions, researchers and innovators can de develop and expand their activities knowing that Finland will increasingly and steadily invest in research and innovation. Dear friends, this seminar, this seminar is organized by the Research and Innovation Council, which I chair as Prime Minister. The Council brings political decision makers and key actors of the research and innovation system around the same table. It is an important forum where we discuss and develop topics in research and innovation policy. This dialogue between different stakeholders is very valuable. The increasing importance of technology means the research and innovation are critical strategic resources for us all. Dear participants, I'm particularly pleased that I can welcome Professor Takahiro Ueyama from Japan's Prime Minister Kishida's Cabinet Office as the keynote speaker in this seminar. Japan's highly ambitious plans for science technology and innovation have been a source of inspiration for us here in Finland. I'm very eager to hear about the sixth science, technology and innovation plan and your views about future of Japanese research and innovation policy. I'm also very interested in hearing about the role of the Council for Science, Technology and Innovation in Japan. I wish you all a very inspiring and innovative seminar. Thank you so much.
Prime Minister, thank you very much indeed. Um, that is as good a way as any to, to get into things. The whole of the forum is, uh, as laid out in 2022, is working out an innovation pipeline that's more sustainable, more robust, and as the Prime Minister said, more inclusive and equitable. So with that, uh, we'll get right into the first session on diversity in research development and innovation. And for that, I'd like to invite up our chair, Deborah Berabiches who's a physicist, data scientist, TV host, science communicator extraordinaire. Deborah, the floor is yours. Thank you very much, Jason. Welcome, everybody. It's an honor for me to be here all the way from Mexico originally. And uh, it really is a privilege to be able to introduce uh, both Dr. Uh, Ueyama, as well as my esteemed members of the panel, we're going to start with a keynote speech uh, by Dr. Takahiro Ueyama, who is a full-time executive member of the Council for Science, Technology, and Innovation at the Cabinet Office of the Japanese government. He uh, joined the Council in 2016 and has devoted himself to expanding the national investment uh, in academic activities in Japan, he launched the sixth basic plan for science, technology, and innovation. He has created the Japanese Open Science Platform, has started a moonshot research and development uh, plan, and he's most committed right now to the University Endowment Fund, which is 10 trillion yen. That is the equivalent of 91 billion euros, which is designed to financially support top-ranked research universities. In addition, he is interested in a new agenda such as economic security and its relation with Japanese academia. Please welcome Dr. Takahiro Ueyama. Well, thank you very much for a warm introduction of myself in this wonderful opportunity to discuss about the Japan science technology innovation policy. My name is Takahiro Ueyama, only one full-time executive member of the Council of the Cabinet Office. The mission of the, our Council is to create a five-year basic plan for science and technology. And in 2016, I was recruited by, by the government to be a member of the Council. And then I have been working so fiercely about how to advance science, technology, and innovation. I'd like to share what we have done at the CSDI with all the members here in the audience so that uh, probably it's a good chance to communicate what we can make the same vision of science technology. So, in 2016, when I joined the council and I encountered a different type of the questions and difficult questions. Number one, how to expand government investment in science technology? Actually, for the last 15 years, government investment has been always stable, around 1% or less than 1%. How we can expand government spending in a science technology. And also, I found that all of the science technology related policy actually scattered in the different ministers. Minister of Education, of course, take care of the science technology, but Minister of Commerce and Economy have something to do with the science technology. How about Minister of Agriculture? How about the Ministry of Transformation? How about the Ministry of Healthcare and Welfare? All of the ministers have to consider about advancement of science technology, but what I found is it's not well organized. We need some sort of the headquarter office, which conducting as a kind of a correlation between different types of the, uh, policies among the science ministers. How we can be a coordinator these kind of different type of directions of science technology in the different ministers. This is a question, I'm sorry. Number one, 
how to improve long-term deep learning research capability in Japan. Actually, we found that the research capability or kind of 1% or 10% cited research article has been declining. Seriously. How we can do that? Of course, we have to expand government investment in science technology, but it's not enough. We have to change the kind of structure of research in each university. Number three, how to create national vision, a national strategy of science and technology. It's not only about science technology, but we have to talk about how science can be a national strategy in our country. This is very important. Third, fourth, how to promote long-term disruptive innovation in Japan. Science this is not just a machine to produce articles. Science has to be a driving force or pushing forward the future of Japan. So we need long-term association with science and engineer in Japan. Fourth, fifth, how to create a policy trajectory, open science, open access, also we have now discussing about economic security issue, which is related to the defense issue. But I'm sorry, today, I don't, due to the time limitation, I cannot get into this topic today. And how to transform Japan's in, in, industrial structures. I was at Stanford University in 1980. At the time, Japanese economy so strong. All of the Japanese company has located the top rank three or four. Now, look at this. We, I can't see only a Toyota in the top 20 enterprise of the world. What happened to Japanese company? What the Japanese in, in, in enterprises? I believe that we need to change, transform industrial structure in Japan. Number one, how to expand science technology investment in Japan? I just believe that. Just forget. The, the purpose of science and technology is the advancement of science and technology only. We have been forgetting how important science technology is to create the common value, common social structures. How important science technology is, we have been uh, uh, forgetting this kind of the value-oriented perspective of science technology. Without this kind of direction, Government will not be able to expand science and technology investment in our country. So we have been creating different type of strategy of expanding science technology investment in our country. So create a policy story from the perspective of social implementation of science and technology. And create a story how science technology can improve society and the world. So these kind of the value-oriented vision of science technology is always backing up our activity to expand uh, government investment in science technology. Look at this uh, picture of the past 25 five-year basic plan. It started in 1996. The first period of basic plan started and during the first three periods, the basic plan has been discussing how science and technology are important. Government should invest more money in science and technology in order to expand, in order to achieve the good uh, articles or good you know, advancement science. And only the first plan, during the first period, the targeted government investment, 1% of GDP was achieved. After that, we have failed to achieve the targeted number, 1% of GDP in Japan. In the fourth period, we began to dis discuss about innovation for the first time. In the fifth period, we introduced the new notion of society 5.0, of course, discussing the value of science technology, but it's not enough. In the course of creating six basic plan, it is the time of pandemic came, and we found that where is the society 5.0? Society 5.0 in the world in which 
physical space and cyber space will be well connected by AI, robotics, or any kind of new technology. But in seeing the kind of current situation under the pandemic, we can see such kind of digitalization of society has not yet achieved in Japan. So in the course of creating the six base program, we have to consider again, what is the society 5.0? How we can create new type of social vision in the name of society 5.0? It is one of the target we have created. And then we have been discussing, what is the value we can create by the science and technology? Of course, we can deal with the decline of population is important. We can discuss about the energy issues, of course, and also we have to consider about the health care. These kind of value will be able to create by the advancement of science technology, but we have failed to figure out how important the value is for the future of society in Japan. So six best plan have been focusing on the value creation cycle by way of the advancement of science and technology. And also we are now facing the new challenge of geopolitical situation in Japan. We have to consider about how tension is going on between America, between America and China. Also we have to consider about you know, defense-related investment in science technology will be crucial for the future of Japanese society. And then this is a picture that how we can we create coordinated of different type of ministries. We collected all of the documents of all ministers. It described the aims and the purposes and outcomes and also the KPI. We collected all the documents from the ministers and made a natural language analysis to the document and picking up the word, and then we have been figuring out, you know, the discretion in the sixth basic program, chapter by chapter, section by section, wording by wording, each of the ministers of the project, how correlated with our sixth basic program. And I have been communicating very intensively with each minister. We want to achieve this kind of the value by way of science technology, you have to consider more seriously about R&D. And also that, for example, in the case of the Minister of Agriculture, they haven't done any sort of research development, just giving us any sort of subsidy to the farmer, etc. But we have been communicating with the Minister of Agriculture. Why didn't you spend so money in, I consult, uh, in the automated uh, farming machines or the in the case of transportation, Minister of Transportation, we have been discussing how to find the good analysis of eye construction. So that there is this kind of conversion policy of SDI. We have been converted some part of the project of Minister of Agriculture or Minister of Transportation into more science and technology related uh, project. And by way that, we have been expanding the government investment in science and technology. It is the kind of number that we have been created. It is always stable from 2001 to the 2018. As a turning point in 2018, government investment in science and technology grew rapidly. Of course, one of the efforts we have done is very helpful to increase this kind of expansion. About every year, 7% of government investment has been growing. Right now, almost we achieved one, over 1% 1 of government investment in science technology and expanding right now. This is how we have expanded the government investment in science and technology. Important is a communication with all of the ministers and under all of the stakeholders of science and technology, not only just the government, but also business sectors and universities, scientists, engineers. 
is all stakeholder must be understand how we can expand the government investment in science technology. And also that we have amended basic law for science technology. This law was enacted in 1995. Based on this basic law, five-year basic plan has been created. The message of this old basic law is very simple. We are a technological and scientific nation that we have to spend more money in science and technology. They're just talking about advancement science, but they fail to discuss about the value that science and technology can bring to our society. We have to consider the value and the problem is that all the basic law has excluded humanities and social scientists from the coverage of science and technology policy. Without humanities, without social science, how we can discuss about the value of the science and technology? So I really want to amend the basic law of science and technology, want to include even the field of science, humanities and social sciences. And also I want to use more, rap, more intensively the notion of innovation in the scope of science and technology policy. So eventually, uh, in the sixth basic plan, uh, we have been emphasizing we need to create very safety and a very resilient society. Society 5.0 is not just a kind of ideal concept. We have to realize the real phase of life, the people live in, who is living in a society 5.0. So in order to do that, we argue that resilience or robustness or safety is important in the society 5.0 we are going to create. And also, we have been argued that this version of society 5.0 is not only for scientists and engineers. It must be the idea for well-being in all the people, all the people in the in society. We have to talk about how important the advancement science is related to the well-being well and also the daily lives. So that uh, we have been thinking, you know, in order to achieve that society 5.0, it's not just like a digitalization society. We must recreate the social system in which people can use easily and happily the digitalization, very freely and also very uh, understandably. We can use advancement science technology, particularly AI, sometimes uh, uh, create some sort of anxiety or a notion of singularity, sometimes cause a very much you know, frenziness in the society. But we have to reconstruct the society system itself in the name of digitalization. And also, the, we have to recreate industrial structure or economic structure. Of course, in the 1980s, our economy was strong, but it's just over. We need a different type of enterprises. We need a different type of industry in our society based on the advancement of science technology. And also the notion of society 5.0 contains some sort of the value that traditional Japanese society has been created. We have a sense of the kind of community, we have a sense of the shared value. We have a sense of the communal uh, governance as one of the comrades in the society. We have this kind of the value. If that value is attractive to all other country, society five concept may be prevailed in other country. So we put this notion of new value of Japan in the concept of society 5.0. And I just, uh, we are just gave up targeting 1% of GDP. It's just our story. We targeted 
not only just 1%, but 30 trillion yen from the government side, 100 trillion yen from the private sector. It's going to be total over 1%, probably 1, uh, 4% or 4 4.2, 4.3 of the GDP will be achieved in the next seventh basic program. And how to improve the research capability of Japan, Japanese academia? Of course, you need to secure the possible external young researchers, improving conditions for doctor students, balancing mission-oriented research and fundamental curiosity research, and increasing various types of the career for PhD. And of course, now we are dealing with handling the huge amount of money of so-called university endowment fund. This is just a picture we show that how uh, our research capability has been declining. I just skip that. In order to understand how our research capability has been dis deteriorated, we collected all of the data about the over 600 thousand scientists and engineers. Their outcome of articles, their patent, their funding from any sort of researches, it turned out to be a very big data. And then by using this data, we can figure out which section is now deteriorating and which section might be the most important uh, field that Japan has to be in, put the investment. So this is kind of a research, for example, how researchers, mo mo researchers mobility and research productivity correlation between these kind of element. And also this is the, uh, now we are, the, the current, you know, the, the, uh, the, the schemes of, of including uh, innovation, uh, university endowment fund. Also, we have been creating a comprehensive promotion package for regional and have unique research universities. Not only just uh, world premier top ranked university, but we are handling all of other universities as a basement of research and, uh, and, and, and the science and technology, and also supporting a, a doctor student, and are now focusing on the startup ecosystem. This is a scheme of University Endowment Fund. As I, as I was introduced, uh, about more than 80 uh, billion dollars, uh, or more, more 80 billion euro, uh, will be used for the University Endowment Fund. We acquired the money from Ministry of uh, Finances, and, and uh, it is a huge amount of money. And we actually borrow the money from Ministry of Finance. The one part of the money actually came from the real money because the Ministry of Finance sold even the gold. And I didn't know that the Ministry of Finance has a gold, but they sold the gold for this a university endowment and created 10 trillion yen. We put this money in GST, and they made the investment machine and began to invest their money in the global market. Now acquire three percentage of this investment. It turned out to be a three billion dollar every year. We are going to select several universities as a world premier university and give them about more than 500 million dollars each year for 20 years in order to create top-ranked world premier, premier university, as you see in the United States, like Stanford, Harvard, or MIT, et cetera. It is a very bold, ambitious uh, framework. We need to, in order to select as a world premier university, you have to consider the recruitment of top talent scientists from our world world, and also the uh, uh, strengthening the financial base. Look at the Harvard University. Harvard University has a $45 billion in endowment. Stanford, $38 billion. While on the other hand, University of Tokyo only have a several million dollars. We need to expand endowment of each university. So we are going to have their growth of endowment in each university by using this university endowment fund. Also, the, we need to, we have been discussing about disrupted innovation, as I said before, the, uh, in the form of the moonshot. 
we have targeting very disruptive, very disruptive innovation long term. Why? Because we need kind of a symbolic, very scientific and advanced theme that Japan has to be uh, uh, searched for. Example is a quantum technology. So that, uh, for example, the goal one, the realizing a society in which human being can be free from limitation of body, brain, and space and time by 2050. Or realization of AI robots that automatically learn and adapt to their environment and evolve in intelligence, act alongside a human being by 2050. Or the realization of Ford Toreland Universal Quantum Computer by 2050. This long term vision of creating the uh, disruptive innovation is a target of Moonshot. And also, in the way of creating technology, some of the technology will be dispersed through the society and maybe good input to the new startup company. And how to transform the industrial structure? Now I'm very much serious about this topic. For example, the Japanese government has to be very discussed about how to organize Japanese enterprises, big company, established company. But they have lose sight of the importance of startup. Startup is a mechanism to replace all the established company with a new form of enterprises. So Kishida administration argued that this year is a startup creation year in Japan. And discussing with the Minister of Economy and Commerce, I found that they don't have a good program for start creating startup culture in Japan. Creating a very entrepreneurial environment in universities, encouraging to move, move talented scientists in Japan from established companies to newly emerging deep tech startups, improving venture capital investment by environment to foster asset owners' investment in venture capitals, promoting public procurement from the startup at national local governmental level and reviewing the stock option system to attract high-skilled domestic and international talents. And also the creation that an environment established a secondary market. We have been proposed these kind of the policy to prime ministers. The prime minister welcomed this uh, new scheme of creating a startup culture. By fostering a startup, will be able to change or transform the current established form of industrial structure into more entrepreneurial, more transforming type of company. So that this is a kind of a scheme strategy. We are creating a startup city, and also the, we have been discussing with the university how to make entrepreneurial curriculum in your universities. And also that we are you know, encouraging the mobility of human resources from established company to startup company. So what I have done at the CSDI can be summarized in this form. Number one, I tried to create a different type of vision of science, technology, innovation, mainly focusing on the value creation network of science and technology. Number two, I tried to expand the government investment in science and technology by, by, by using these kind of new discourses of, 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 of value-oriented uh, science and technology policy. Number three, we have been working on reforming a university system. Very old national university system has to be replaced by new type of research universities. Number four, we try to create new talent and human resources, particularly in the form of PhDs. We have been encouraging younger generation when go to the PhD program, and with these degrees, they're gonna change the society. 
by way of science technology. And also the number five, we try to create the bold startup strategy. It is going to transform established industrial structure in the future, and then create completely different phase of public-private partnership in Japan. It is going to be expand the national level of science technology investment in the future. And this is a kind of we call the innovation ecosystem in Japan. By using this kind of framework, we can boast that in the future, we are world-famous innovation-oriented country. So uh, I really hope that we can share the same notion of value-oriented science and technology innovation policy, and probably we can learn from you. Since I came here, I, I have been talking with many people, uh, BDT today, yesterday Nokia. I found quite similar but quite similarity between our two countries in terms of the science technology. Also, uh, you have facing uh, some sort of new different challenge from Russia. Uh, we are going to face quite a similar situation in Asia. So I really hope uh, my visit to Finland is going to be create a basement of cooperation between two countries. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you so much for such a detailed uh, speech on what Japan is doing to foster innovation, research, and development. As we know, we live in a world that needs more justice, uh, better uh, opportunities for young people, and more equity in terms of distribution of wel welfare and so on. And I, I, I love seeing two countries like Japan and Finland collaborate to that end. So thank you very much. Uh, and I love how Prime Minister Sanamarin set the stage very nicely with some of the statistics she shared. And since this is our session on diversity in RDI, research, development, and innovation, I'd like to remind you just that she said about slightly over 30% of the executives in companies are women. And with so many incredible things and resources that Finland has, such as its amazing higher education, there's a lot of work that can be done. And I commend the efforts of the Ministry of Culture and Education, who has sponsored the Kotamo project, which is a whole research project on how to foster equity and how to prevent discrimination in higher education institutions in Finland. Uh, you will be able to read that uh, research and its results very soon in November. Uh, and also, I'd like to uh, now move on to our panel. Uh, I think uh, the committee has selected an incredible uh, panel with three distinguished uh, members that I will now introduce. First, we have Tuli Ahava. Please come on stage. Tuli is a digital automation leader at Nokia, and she currently leads business around the newly launched Nokia MX Industrial Edge for realizing the industri Industrial 4.0 promise uh, powered by edge computing. And she believes in collaboration, ecosystems, and the power of sharing. Next on stage is Dr. Mart Norma. Please welcome. Uh, he's an innovation leader in the field of space and defense. He has led teams developing battlefield robotics reforming higher education as the Vice Rector of Academic Affairs at the University of Tartu in Estonia, and he has been building spacecrafts for interplanetary space uh, flight, also at the University of Tartu. Currently, and very importantly, he is leading the efforts to maintain peace and security in global cyber domain as the Director of NATO Cooperative Cyber Defense Center of Excellence. Welcome. And finally, let me welcome esteemed uh, Dr. Taina Pilayaniemi, who is one of the leading scientists in the field of matrix biology. 
She has headed three Academy of Finland Center of Excellences, and she was a scientist co-founder of Fibrogen Inc., a US-based biopharmaceutical company focusing on fibrosis and other medically critical targets. Thank you. Again, welcome. Our, uh, uh, we're very, very honored to be here. Thank you for our audience who is here, uh, physically present, and thank you for our audience who is watching us online. We're going to begin uh, our panel discussion. Uh, and first, uh, you know, one of the statistics that I read uh, a couple of weeks ago that really struck me was the fact that uh, only 7% of CEOs of public companies in Finland are led uh, by women. And so clearly there's, you know, a lot of work to be done. And I think we do have exemplary advocates in this panel. And so my first question will be, that you know, it's no surprise that equality in RDI correlates with improvement in the quality of RDI activities, right? The more diverse uh, the principal investigators are, the probably the harder they've had to fight to get to where they are, and so they will attract more diverse talents. So in your experience, each one of you, what are the best ways that you've taken into account gender and intersecting factors uh, in the design and delivery of research and innovation? Let's see, Tuli. Okay, let me go first. Um, first of all, at Nokia, we create the technology to help the whole world act together. Technology, act, and together. And we believe in research, we live and breathe research. And uh, the research clearly shows that more inclusion, more diversity, happier customers, happier end users, better business. Uh, that's that's number, number one. And secondly, uh, we shouldn't ever forget that we are human beings working, for example, big, big corporations like Nokia. And I'm from the age of my favorite band used, used to be a band called Nirvana. <laughs> and they have a great song that say, says, come as you are. Yes. So inclusion, diversity goes back to the fact that you have psychological safety. You feel you can be true yourself uh, when you join, for example, Nokia family. Love that. Thank you. Mart. Thank you very much. I think um, that's uh, one of the most important questions about uh, today's topic. And I think it's uh, pretty easy to answer because um, um, we, we accept the fact that uh, diversity is uh, good for R RDI. So um, uh, why it is that? It's easy, kind of simple for biologists or physicists to understand because we talk about evolution. Evolution pro uh, produces uh, different produces diversity from the diverse environments, different environments. So the same, I believe, works in, uh, in innovation as well. So in order to have innovation, we need to have diverse environments to create these innovations. That means different labs and different people in the lab, different points of view, exactly as uh, Tuli said. So uh, I don't believe that we actually need to focus, that uh, focusing on diversity as a special thing would be as good as focusing on just better RD, uh, RDI, research development and innovation, and diversity should be accepted as one of the key enablers and tools to achieve better results in innovation. Wow, very interesting. Thank you. And Dina? Well, I could, I could uh, begin by saying that, of course, we have great laws and goals in equity and di diversity. But what we need is better mainstreaming of our act activities. And thinking about from where I come from, from the scientific base, for, for, for a long time, science has sort of fragmented and specialized. And that's not going to be a good way of solving the problems of the future. We have to have horizontal cooperation and coalescence of, of 
expertise that is deep and, and vertical. And so science and innovation is needed for solving all the big questions of today's world. But actually, it's good to understand that all these questions also carry a gender impact. So when making policies by the government or when making ambitious research projects by, by us in the universities, I advocate taking into account equality and diversity issues from the day one of planning, planning a new governmental law or planning a new research project, and not thinking about equality and diversity at at the last stage when the project has been planned and when it's more like a, a superimposed rather than integrated aspect. So integrating better our excellent policies to our planning. I really appreciate that you said that, Taina, because there are, I think, famous examples in, especially in automation and artificial intelligence that have happened because they only take into account diversity as an afterthought, after the research has been done. And so you, we, people who work in uh, machine learning and AI always say garbage in, garbage out. That is, if you <laughs> pilot your code and your algorithm with a biased sample of the population, you will get a terrible result that will perpetuate the bias that uh, was put uh, you know, in. And we have examples of, a, a, for example, the soap dispensers that were designed and calibrated with a laser when you put your hand underneath were calibrated only with a sample of white skin people. <laughs> And there is a famous, you can Google it, it's on YouTube, there's a famous case of an African-American man putting his hand at a conference and not getting soap dispensed. And it went viral because you know, his uh, white skin colleague went and, and did that. Similarly, when the airbags were designed for cars, they only took a certain size of men, typically the mannequins designed for safety uh, um, uh, tests were, were men. And so in the beginning, kids and women were uh, pretty badly injured because they were not calibrated for that. And, you know, we have uh, all kinds of things. So ethics, the, uh, the more the world gets automated and the more that technology can be used for uh, you know, policies that are, you know, segregating and, and so on, the more that we need to pay attention to that. Uh, another issue that uh, comes up is international talent. You know, Finland is a bit far away, but not so far away, and it's quite attractive, and it's becoming increasingly attractive for foreign talent. And we do know that Finland is trying to attract technology talent. Such a program is what brought me, for example. So what do each one of you think is needed to better integrate international talent in our society? Um, Taina. Maybe I can start, uh, so we change the turns. Uh, so many things, of course, and, and good thing to remember is that we will become even more and more international rapidly. So this issue is not going away, but, but becoming more important. I think that we need to look at attraction and better integration at different levels. So let's say policy level. We need to have visa processes that are smooth, rapid. Organizatorial level, we, we have all our equality and diversity policies, but we have to actually see that they are implemented in the organizations and include a good reception of our international staff and, and thinking of their practical issues, the bank accounts and housing, but also socially integrating into our coffee room discussions and, and evening events. And then I think the society has to integrate our international people better. The, the, the capital region is much more international than, for example, my region, but uh, we need to, in the society, be able to take care of spouse programs, schooling for the children, and, and so on. And maybe I will finish by saying that we actually have a four-year NICE program, which is called the Talent Boost Program. It's governmentally supervised, 
and the universities, cities, and so on are, are all part of it. And there we are piloting better ways of, 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 of inclusion and integration of international staff. So doing these things that we are starting in a better way now. Excellent. Yes. If I could continue from here, then uh, the word keyword is society, and I strongly believe that it all starts from society uh, readiness to accept uh, multinational talents. And um, uh, I think we need to work from policy making level to, uh, to show, and actually everybody who understands uh, the value, we need to show this value to the nation. And I can actually, I can uh, show you one, some evidence mm -hmm. of um, maybe some as a result of an experimentation, how uh, uh, Finnish society's readiness to invest into uh, multi-talents uh, or multinational talents has worked out uh, and. Well, the experiment is like that. Like 20, uh, 20 years ago, I, as a young student, uh, moved to Finland, opiskelin teknilisella korkeakoululla, viisi vuotta. Ja voin sanoa, että minä äh, rakastan kaikki suomalaisia ja Suomea. And this uh, period of my five years in Finland has uh, um, given me this enormous gratitude to Finnish taxpayers for <laughs> paying my education. So I gave a promise that every time when I have a chance, when I meet a Finn or I can speak publicly in national television, I will tell all Finnish taxpayers, thank you for putting your tax money into my education. <laughs> now, let's see the results of the experiment. <laughs> Here I am, director of NATO Cyber, Cooperative Cyber Defense Center of Excellence. <laughs> and the first nation I wanted to visit as a director was Finland. <laughs> <laughs> it's not exactly that I come from Estonia, and Estonians <laughs> always come to Finland first. But uh, anyway, uh, I can uh, tell you that uh, there are stories like that, thousands and thousands, millions of stories like that, when true kind of uh, war welcome and sincere welcome to a society, people from abroad will stay in the nation. All, it doesn't matter if they move away, but they still become ambassadors to the nation. And uh, I think this is one of the best investments a nation can do. Absolutely. Yeah, I'll add to, add to it's difficult to beat. Uh, that was such a, such a great story, <laughs> and thanks for, 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 for that. Um, but add, I add a few short points. Uh, uh, Nokia, we have, I guess, 80 nationalities in Finland. Wow. So we are crazy diverse already in this country. And yet, so it's not anymore a small village, a Pienikylä. It's actually a, a city. Mm. Uh, so we can do so much. You know, we can... Um, have some fun, we, we need to take care of not only about the talent that who comes and works with us, but also the family of the talent. Very often, people we hire have also highly educated spouse. We want to offer, or Finland to offer work also for the, for the spouse. So it's not only companies alone, it's the state, it's the cities. In our case, Espo, Tampere, Oulu, very, very dear, very, very important for for uh, the whole, whole uh, vast topic of not only getting the talent, diverse talent, but also keeping the talent in Finland. If I might uh, give a, key, a quick comment. Uh, when I was vice rector of Tartu University, I kind of figured that uh, we had a lot of international staff coming over to the university, and quite often they left when this uh, dedicated funding for this uh, exchange was uh, running out, and there was uh, one group of uh, professors who, and researchers who stayed at the university, and uh, they were those who married to a uh, Estonian spouse during their stay in Estonia. So what we thought actually was that we promise you a job at Tartu University which comes with a spouse. <laughs> in, in, Finland, in Finland, it's those that the come and marry a Finnish woman. <laughs> they stay. <laughs> I'm neutral. Men go, go well nicely as well. Yeah. Good. So, you know, it's easy sometimes to what Americans call pay lip service. So a lot of companies just want to put the check mark like, okay, I'm, you know, I have a diversity and inclusion policy and I'm doing this and that, I have meetings. But it's, it's hard these days to find companies that are authentically and organically really 
uh, caring and enacting policies. For example, the Philharmonic Orchestra in New York started, and I was actually present in one of them, doing blind interviews, which means that they realized people who came to interview for a position, they immediately saw, and, and the statistics were that, it's, I think, over 60% probability if they were a man competing with a woman, playing the, the cello or something, the, the man would get a position. So they now put a black curtain in front and, and the committee cannot see the gender of the person, they can only listen to the beautiful sound of the instrument, and this is how they were picking, and the, the amount uh, of women went up exponentially as time, because this has been going on for 10, 15 years. So, you know, what uh, I'd like to ask people in the panel, share uh, your biggest accomplishment, something that actually led to something that achieved your diversity and equity uh, and inclusion goals in the past year? Well, if I can share something, but first I would like to say, Debbie, uh, to continue what, what you, you just told, I think we can call this the unconscious bias. We are all afflicted by that. But what we need to know is that we are afflicted by an unconscious bias, and that's why the screen helps in that kind of situation. But there are many situations where you cannot put a black curtain. <laughs> but uh, yes, yes to, I was thinking, uh, I'm thinking of, of actually trying to work towards uh, equality and diversity through bigger consortia through our collaborations, and, and one collaboration that I would like to give as an example, for my university, the University of Oulu is a partner of one of the European uni University networks, uh, and this network is called UNIC, Universities of Post-Industrial Cities, and very recently this UNIC consortium uh, has set up what is called the Super Diversity Academy, which develops uh, inclusive education for a very diverse population. It also tries to develop frameworks for including citizens, the civil society, cities, and other operators in research and innovation activities. And I think that this gives power by volume and by actually working with not only our internal diverse community, which is extensive actually, but with more or less all of Europe. Thank you. Totally. Maybe I, I go next. Um, so within a year, ah, it's so nice because I have several things to report from the Nokia family. Let me, let me start with one. You said a moment ago, Debbie, that uh, policies. You might think like that, but a, a company like Nokia, we act based on a strategy. It's a business strategy, technology strategy, innovation strategy, and we really implement strategy. We do have diversity strategy, and we really take it seriously. Uh, clear goals, everyone, I'm a leader, I'm building a team, I'm leading units. Uh, I have also a, like numeric goals to make sure that when I hire you, I, I hire you uh, with the diverse wow. glasses on. So that's, that's number one. We have a strategy that we really follow. If you had asked that five years ago, wouldn't have happened. I couldn't have given this answer, so uh, yeah. it's new, very serious, and very important. And then the other one is that I, I really love. We have a global, launch this year, we have a global new child leave policy. So a new parent, regardless of gender, any type of family, uh, uh, can uh, get the 90 days um, child uh, care leave globally. In Finland, this sounds like Mm -hmm. <laughs> but globally, these are very, very important elements to attract uh, talent, attract uh, diverse talent. And uh, even though I'm not raising a family at, at this point of my life or my career, I'm very proud of these type of activities. And I'm going to steal half a minute. This is uh, two years ago. We as Nokia, we closed the so-called unexplained uh, gender-related pay gap. It's amazing, globally. I felt super proud at when we did that. We invested in making sure that someone is not paid less because of gender. Those were my three, two this wow. year, <laughs> and one of it earlier. Thank you. That is incredible, and it is a testament to Nokia really walking the 
the talk, right? So that, that's fantastic. Now, we have a few minutes, and I want to ask a question that we didn't plan for, but I've been intensely curious about. When I heard about Finland, I heard of this, you know, there's equality and there's a lot of participation of women in government, and they're in higher education, there are more women in STEM, in science, technology, engineering, and math. I myself was almost always in Mexico and in the United States the only woman or one of two or three amongst a hundred men in, in my cohort, in my PhD, etc. But when I came to Finland, I realized that the number of women selecting, even though they have the freedom to do so, selecting careers in physics, math, engineering, is actually lower than what could be expected. It's quite comparable to many of the countries where there is tremendous strong stigma to be a woman in science, like there was for me. So I learned the term the Nordic paradox, which happens in countries that give full freedom of you know, selection and higher education opportunities to women, yet they choose not to pursue careers in STEM. Do you have any idea why that happens? Well, uh, a quick answer would be uh, maybe not so politically correct, but I say let's embrace uh, diversity. So if some people, uh, some, uh, people choose to select other careers, then I definitely know some careers I would never like to, uh, to uh, select. So uh, maybe this is just nature. Uh, I'm not, uh, I don't know exactly the answer. And of course, all my life I have, fight, I have fought for popularizing uh, science, especially space uh, research and science in Estonia. And I think I have done a good job there, but uh, I, we never achieved a moment where we would have had equal number of uh, girls and boys in our programs. Okay, interesting. Yeah, I, th I think this is a <laughs> very perplexing issue. Uh, you know that <laughs> the Finnish job market is very segre unusually segregated, women's job and men men's job. And <laughs> rather disappointingly, also us in the universities can, sh should recognize that we have segregation within the universities disciplinary-wise. So we have, we have the technical, maybe, maybe all of the STEMs, but at least the te technical fields and ICT, very male dominated, and then we have soci social sciences, humanity, actually very female dominated. You, you may have a problem in finding a, a, a male professor. Yes. So, so segregation also according to disciplinary lines, and, and it is, Finland differs from the other Scandinavian countries. They are less segregated, probably to some extent they are, but Finland stands out, and why is that is something that would... I don't know the research about that, but it, it is perplexing, and I think it doesn't make sense. For example, ICT, very male-dominated, and um, what... A job that is a... Well, in a, in a way, not a physical job, but an easy task by the computer, and, and nowadays, women and, and men are, are computer experts. So why do women not go more into ICT, for example? I don't know. Maybe it's understandable that some heavy mining uh, duties are, 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 are male-dominated. But, but uh, to me, it's not understandable why some areas are so male-dominated. So I think what we need to do is we need to highlight role models, role models that are very uh, well-succeeding uh, females and also international role models so that we don't all only talk about uh, women and men segregation but also on the fact that that our international body of for example students and staff in universities need to be able to better advance to higher levels yeah the question is really really tricky why stem in Finland less females or less girls. I, I think it, something already happens probably at the school time, mm -hmm. and, and uh, the interest gets lower. And all I can say here is a little bit uh, repeat what Taina Yuche uh, just said. Girls out there, uh, learn your numbers are lovely. 
just learn enough of, of the STEM. You don't need to do crazy difficult equations throughout your career, <laughs> but you need to know how to use Excel, and you need to also uh, learn to understand and separate the essential from non-essential. So I just encourage our ICT or STEM carriers and companies in Finland, for example, Nokia, super, super exciting, and you know, uh, just go for it, and, and let's break the bias. Yeah. Thank you. This is <laughs> quite insightful. <laughs> uh, and yes, the answer that I've been given several times has been in line with what uh, the two women said, <laughs> not so much with what Mart said, although that's an interesting perspective, but it has been that Finland still follows very traditional roles. And so even though it's accessible, there isn't that much activism, like in other countries where they go to the schools and even at a daycare level, and they do science fairs and they place posters of young women going to space or having the opportunity you know, to do research in quantum computing. And so it's available, but if my generations in my family of women have been teachers or more into the humanities, then I may not even consider it as an option. And so I do think this is an area where Finland could be doing uh, a lot in, in um, vo get, getting volunteers of careers, to, of STEM careers, to go ahead and, and be more present. Okay, um, I have one more question. So what are some creative ways to proactively source candidates from underrepresented communities, whether it be foreigners, whether it be women, or you know, other uh, intersectional uh, factors, without making them feel tokenized. Meaning, you know, many a times I have been answering a phone call that says, can you please join our panel because I need another woman. I need a woman, I don't have one. <laughs> Not because it's you, not because you have something to share, but I need my quota for women. So how do we attract international uh, or you know, women or diverse uh, people to the workforce without making them feel that we're only considering them because we need to fill feel, feel our quotas? <laughs> Maybe I can, I can continue with an anecdote and then my real answer. So, uh, well, being part of a quota, I have, all, I have many times, I feel, been invited into so many committees nationally and also internationally being, to be one of the female uh, quota. But I have a double uh, quota. I'm a female from northern Finland, <laughs> and that, that's at least in the Finnish uh, uh, co committees. I have always considered it as, as an honor, and I will do my best and, and disregard any quotas. So I think my advice is to whatever reason you are invited f for to, to, to a, a duty and task and, and so on, just do it and do it well. And uh, then you will be asked again, of course. But, uh, but your question, what are innovative ways I think my answer is maybe not innovative, maybe dull, but I'm, 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 I'm thinking that we need to be better in involving our international students and personnel in all of our policy making, in all of our planning, and uh, so, so, that, so that it becomes integral to us that we actually always ask a diverse representation in, in, into planning. And that will change, of course, the outcomes of the plans, and it will include the much more diverse view into when we make a policy of this and a policy of that. And then, of course, I would like to bring in the topic of the Finnish language. So <laughs> Not an easy we, we have to consider that. To what extent does our international personnel need to learn Finnish for their uh, advancing in their career? Whom? Who are those that should, we should advise to learn Finnish and who can disregard it? Because, of course, in universities, for example, the environment is such that you, you perfectly well survive in English. But you are discriminated against uh, 
certain tasks, and if I may say so, a lot of our ministerial tasks come in Finnish, and maybe in Swedish, but certainly not in English. <laughs> Thank you, Dain. So, uh, uh, coming back to where I, we started, uh, where I started, is that um, innovation happens because of different ideas popping up here and there, so, and also examples of how we uh, should have my, uh, minorities and diversity in our committees. I think it all just shows that diversity is a value. So diversity will generate as a value for nation, for our organization. So um, I think we should focus on the value, not that we pick you because you are fin Finnish and you are Swedish and you are Estonian and so on and so on. But the big thing is that we all want to have more value out of our, our organization. So um, that is a now not negative, but positive aspect of being part of that group because diversity was a basic value, how we set it up. So I think uh, we Absolutely. could play on this positive side here. I like that. <laughs> and too. Yeah, you, you asked for creative ways. Yes. And I actually go a little bit uh, what, what Stein, I know you started a moment ago. I think that in this very field, let's first put the basics right. I love to be creative and innovative, but here there are many basic things that let's first fix them. Um, at, in, in Nokia, uh, we put people in the heart of our, our everything, in the heart of our strategy. And we also have a very important uh, a set of colleagues. Uh, they are our uh, talent attraction team. So globally, we have a, a people management organization uh, specialists who are uh, tasked to go and help us managers to find uh, uh, diverse candidates. So I give kudos to that group of, uh, group of colleagues, uh, and they are really tasked to think uh, and help us find, uh, hunt, uh, with the diversity and inclusion classes on. And my, my other answer goes, or other, other um, uh, not that creative, but going back to the way I also started from, I, I started with this come as you are. So Nokia is a family, and in a family you have different opinions, but you still live under the same roof. And it's the same uh, with this inclusion topic. Everyone needs to feel safe to bring their views, come as they are uh, um, around the table and be included. And, and I think that that's also a little bit, uh, Daina and Mart, what you both said, that, that uh, it all inclusion is to be and bring yourself and be part of making decisions and, and make, making growth and making tomorrow. Yeah, not that creative, but basics right first. <laughs> yeah, I like that. I, I really appreciate that, and I think you know the movement uh, internationally right now is to not be mentors for all those uh, successful men and women in the audience, to not be mentors so much as to be champions. And the difference is that a mentor helps you when you have an issue, you have a problem, you come to the mentor and say, how do I deal with this decision, this problem at work? And you help them. But a champion is somebody who, when you're not in the room, proposes you for a new opportunity, puts your name at the table for a promotion, for a different role, gives you more responsibility even when you are not asking for it. And so it goes a step beyond, and I really uh, appreciate that. Uh, now, I do want to take a few questions from the audience, but before I do that, I want to end, uh, inspired by what Mart uh, just said about value, I want to end by asking a, if you could use one single word to tell me what the issue of diversity, equity, and inclusion means to you, in like value, like one word, what would it be? Happiness. Happiness, like that. Together. Together. One word, crazy difficult. Um, I'll pick the word tomorrow. Lovely. For me, the word would be maybe hope, hope <laughs> for the future. Okay, thank you so much. And uh, we have time for questions from the audience. So I know there's a microphone going around and I'm just going to ask, you can ask anything, just please stand up and state your name 
before, for the cameras before you ask the question. Okay, I think we have one over here. Thank you very much for amazing discussion. Uh, we have just today published uh, research results on how uh, foreign experts who live and work in Finland, how Finland, what kind of a country it is for them. And I feel that your discussion was really spot on. One big difficulty what they are facing is especially when you move to Finland following your spouse. That is the difficult situation. 51% of spouses have to change their career. So my question would go a little bit deeper on how to help them. You said something about spouse programs and so on, but is there more that, for example, companies like Nokia could do? I understood that you do a lot already. And the study is uh, published by E2 Research, e tutkimus and it's openly available in Finnish and in English. Thank you. And my name is Mariko Niemi. I'm not sure if I presented myself. Apologies. Thank you. Now maybe I, I try to start first of all this first uh, research and like I said that we stand behind research and, 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 and figures and uh, build on that, the whole, whole business. Um, there is more, I'm sure that there is more that could be done. And, uh, and uh, we have, in, in Nokia we have started by that we know this dilemma and we try to address it, but, and, and of course we have a lot of also uh, fam family members who are working, working with Nokia, but we can't promise uh, someone who brings the spouse along that for sure there is also a job. Rather, it should be again a collaboration between, between the, the different, different actors and, and, and within the, the ecosystem, the word I, I, I like a lot. Um, so, I think we are doing what we, what we can from the Nokia point of view, but that's probably not enough. And we need to study now uh, as part of our diversity activities. And I said we have the strategy. We need to study those results. So happy to take them. Marie, Marie <laughs> check my name. Let's get to know each other. And I'll pass them uh, on our side where, where they belong. But, but uh, together we can, we can sort these things. Uh, not single company alone, not the state alone, and not the cities alone. Maybe I can... can continue a little bit by saying that yes, we have, we have in our university noticed this for sure because for some very high level recruitments we have the scientist is, is, is highly interested in, in moving to our university from, from somewhere else and, and, and discussions are going really well in the scientific community and then the spouse says, uh, comes and visits because it's important to also have the spouse coming and visiting. And sometimes it's possible to, to provide some possibility to integrate within the university, but as, uh, as Tuli said, not, not, not all, all, always. And, uh, and, and, and then the final decision is actually based on whether the spouse is willing to move or not. So what we do need and what we are trying to do with this, for example, with this Talent Boost program that I mentioned earlier is, is to, to build cooperation between the, the employing organization and, and the municipality and city and, and, and companies. And there we need quite a lot of flexibility and we, we need to pilot these kind of joint recruitments. Of course, the schools for children are very important, but I think international schools ex exist widely in, in, in those cities that we are, we are talking about. But, but there is an obstacle, and of course the Finnish language is an obstacle as well. All those, although many, many, a vast majority of people that, that, that one deals with are actually capable of communicating in English, that is a strong point of Finland, actually. Mm -hmm. So at, um, at our organization, NATO's Cooperative Cyber Defense Center of Excellence, we have about 38 nations uh, present every day, and, um, and a lot of them are coming for deployments for two years, three years, and uh, most of them come with their families. So I strongly believe, not only in case of kind of international uh, deployments, but uh, at national level as well. You can't uh, contribute to the, to the achievement of your organization if you are unhappy at home. So happiness at home also enables you to provide more to society. You, can, you have the security and belongings level covered in a pyramid of human needs and you can focus on achievement. 
And uh, there, I think that the organizations have to take it very seriously. seriously. The, to some extent, to uh, reach out to the families to understand if there is something that can be done. Luckily, um, at least in Estonia, I don't know how it is in Finland, but in Estonia, there is no jobless. There is t tens and tens of thousands of positions available. People are needed. Uh, so um, if. And they can get a visa to work, the uh, spouse? It's, uh, it's, uh, I would say it's very easy. It's, uh, there is no problem with that because uh, everybody acknowledges uh, it's, a, it's a problem of uh, don't having enough people. And that's a kind of major showstopper for economic growth. So I know uh, families of our, uh, our people, they work, some of them do charity, some of them uh, teach English, some of them, uh, yeah. well, they do all, uh, some of them just uh, choose to stay at home. So a la large variety there, but at least I have to be say, uh, sure that I have done my best to understand the situations yeah. and if possible then support through my net, uh, local networks. That's, that's really wonderful. And I myself have been an immigrant in different countries and I do think that immigration here is a bit of a hurdle. And if it could be improved and giving limited work opportunities to spouses that could enable more uh, change. Okay, another question please. Anything I'd love to hear. Yes, here. Well, we have here in the cent very center, please. If, <laughs> and please, if you can stand up, state your name and yeah. tell your question. So, Patrick Henelius from Obo Academy University. Um, so, I, I, I agree that the Talent Boost program is, is, is a very good program to get international talent uh, out into Finnish society. Uh, I think it's also easy for large companies like Nokia to absorb international talent. Uh, our experience is that it's much harder for small and mid-sized companies. Uh, to uh, There's a barrier to employ your first uh, international, uh, uh, international person for example, if the company has always used Finnish uh, in the, around the coffee machine, uh, does the whole small company of five, ten people switch to English? Uh, so how, do you have any suggestions for how to solve this integration question for small and mid-sized companies? Thank you. No, I say one thing. I say one thing. I don't come from a small and mid-sized company, but, but, um, but this, this phenomenon is, is so well known. Uh, and I really, really hope, because the next generation, the children, they don't anymore have this language barrier. I mean, they will, they outrule us by, by the, when they are 10 years old, with, for example, speaking English. So we, we just need to start <coughs> forcing to change the culture little by little. It doesn't change Finnish culture, it's just the language in there. And, and I, I hope that, uh, you know, it's, it's by, by example. But it's just that it's not anymore that I don't know how to speak. Yeah. It's just that let's just uh, have at least uh, like, uh, like the tendency towards, towards that. Yeah. But, but again, I don't represent exactly that, that company space, but I really think that some good things happen because the next generation is overruling with their language skills if you think about the Finnish yeah. woman yes. like I am. No, and I agree 100%. And at VTT, it was, you know, you get hundreds of different companies and cultures integrating. And I think all the Finns at VTT understand that English has to be the, the common language at work. And if you want to later go and have fun with your colleagues and speak in Finnish, that's obviously available. But the times are changing and we're not going to move forward and integrating all these incoming cultures if we don't put that, that effort. Yeah. So if we embrace diversity, then diversity is also that some companies are international and some companies uh, maintain their working language, uh, the, the local language. I don't see any problem with that. And then if the company's organization feels that diversity would bring more value to it, then, uh, then that's a motivation to adopt and the motivation to kind of... Uh, to speak, the, to create the environment where this international person or minority representative can feel uh, uh, secure and safe and provide value for the company. So very pragmatic. But I don't think that there is anything wrong for foreigners to learn to speak Finnish in Finland. But maybe, maybe one thing, thing to, to, to keep in mind is that, like you said, for Estonia, we, we really lack the working force and, and, and we, we, we will the, the need for people employ, employed here, there, and everywhere, including companies, of course, 
is even growing. So is it so that, that by necessity even small and mid-sized companies have to begin to employ uh, uh, for international personnel? So maybe the change is coming whether you want it or not. <laughs> I like this. Okay, one last question, please. Uh, okay, here in the front. Sorry. Uh, thank you. Uh, Purva Ganu from Aalto University. So thank you for the discussions. My question is more specific to Finland. Uh, so, you know, Finland is a highly networked society, and also that brings a lot of advantages in terms of collaboration if you're within the network. But let's say if you're outside of the network, it can be hard to get in, and especially one thing related to that is kind of the lack, there is explicit knowledge, but there is a lot of, let's say, implicit or tacit knowledge that maybe as an international you're lacking. So my question would be, uh, first of all, do you think that kind of implicit, like cultural behavior, norms, practices, kind of information is, let's say, lacking in terms of being given to international talent? And secondly, if so, do you have some ideas, both on a, let's say, institutional level, but also organizational or personal level that we can do to make the kind of implicit information tr flow to the international talent. Thank you. Well, I think I must agree with you, unfortunately. From my viewpoint, it looks exactly the same. And, and what, what, what can we do? We have to break the network norm and we have to implement diversity into practical level, so that it, we are not only gathering the usual suspects to plan this and plan that, but we actually have to implement diversity. I, I, and that's what I'm thinking. And I'm thinking about that we need to learn to translate our culture and mm -hmm. not to be that closed. I mean, we yes. travel, we are... Uh, global, we have massive uh, international companies, but have we learned to translate our culture beyond all we love sauna and, you know, maybe there is something, you know, to give, that's a, that's a very, very good question. And I, I think we, yes. as, as Finns and as the ambassadors of Finnish culture should think a little bit more, what is it actually mm -hmm. there? And I'm sure that it would be a great, great uh, research, uh, you know, topic and, and also could be then implemented with Beautiful. tips. Yes. A book? Yes. Something? A cool. TV show? Yeah. Mm. And I think it goes both ways. Uh, it's very good, uh, good things that you, uh, you say. I think the more you f uh, we as uh, foreigners in Finnish uh, society feel that society is open to us and welcomes us, the more we want to contribute from our side. Either by learning the language, trying to go into offices, trying to use your limited vocabulary and speak up. And we are pride, uh, proud about the feelings that we, uh, we are giving something back to society. Either through our main research work or uh, or then through this cultural uh, uh, integration and cooperation. It's very good. <laughs> Thank you so much to my esteemed panelists. Thank you to the audience online and in person. This has been amazing and an honor. We'll be around if you want to continue the conversation. It shouldn't end here. And best of luck for everyone here. Thank you. Thank you. And all of the panelists, thank you very much indeed. Deborah, thank you for running um, a fantastic first session. Um, lots of views and perspectives to think about. Just a couple of things, though, that I want to point out that really resonated with me. Uh, Deborah, your point about the, uh, the, the mentor versus champion. The thing is about mentorship is there's often a program. You get assigned a mentor. Perhaps you request one. You can just choose to be a champion. So I would say choose to be a champion. The other thing is, um, from Dr. Yama's talk, uh, for anyone who's here thinking about university finance, he's found the solution. <laughs> Just get the finance ministry to cut loose some of those gold reserves. Problem <laughs> solved. Thank you very much. <laughs> right, that is it for the first day of uh, the forum. There is, of course, a lot more tomorrow. Three more sessions on the green transition, digital transformation, and resilience. Small point of order for those of you who are going to be attending the Millennium Technology Prize ceremony. The doors will reopen at 5.15. Please be in your seats uh, by 5.50 so we can get things underway on time. For now, thank you very much for your attention and we'll see you tomorrow. Great stuff. Thank you very much. <laughs>